Every time I see pundits discussing whether college athletes should be paid, I never see them answer the most important question. Where is the money going to come from? In this video, we're going to find a solution. It's time to now pay players. Do not get to participate in any way. They're making so much money off those kids. That by collusion, all the universities say you can't ask for pay, and if you do, it is unethical. We're going to treat this issue like a puzzle, and I want you to help me uncover where we're going to find the money to pay the athletes. The first part of this video is explaining why they don't get paid, and at the end of this video, I'm going to show you my plan for getting the athletes paid. The NCAA announced it has reached a 14-year, nearly $11 billion agreement with CBS and Turner Sports for TV rights to a 68-team March Madness tournament. SEC reaches $3 billion deal with Disney. University of Texas Athletics generated a record $223.9 million in revenue during its 2018-2019 fiscal year. College athletics fans see these TV contracts and wonder how are athletes not getting paid if they are generating billions of dollars for the NCAA and their universities? We need to start by looking at the NCAA's finances and see where the money is actually going. For the year ending August 31st, 2019, the NCAA generated over $1.1 billion of revenue, almost $900 million in television and marketing rights fees, and over $177 million from hosting championships and tournaments. If the NCAA were analyzed as a company, this is a billion dollar operation. And if it were on the exchange, I like the stock. A quick look at the year ending August 31st, 2020 shows total revenue at 519 million, 50% drop in revenue because of the health event. We'll see in a minute what they spend on insurance, but this is why organizations like the NCAA pay a lot of money for insurance and keep millions in cash reserves. Back to 2019, total expenses for the year are 1.047 billion dollars, 93.7 percent expense ratio. Due to events being canceled and the revenue drop, the expense ratio for 2020 was 110.75 percent, a big loss for the NCAA. One billion dollars in expenses and the athletes aren't getting paid. Why can't the NCAA just take a little bit of that money and send it to the players? And where is that money actually going? The NCAA has three divisions. Division 1 contains 350 schools, Division 2 310 schools, and Division 3 438 schools. Across all three divisions, there are an estimated 482,000 student athletes, 1,100 schools, and nearly half a million athletes. This is a massive organization. The expenses are distributed as shown in this chart. The money the NCAA earns goes towards grants and scholarships, insurance, compensation, event operations, and travel, among other things. Nearly all of the money earned goes back into the events, the athletes hosting championships, travel for teams, among many other expenses they incur. Regardless of what you believe about the NCAA, they put out a pretty awesome product. I had the privilege for playing Division II baseball for a team that won our conference and we had teammates get drafted, but the program didn't generate a lot of revenue. We weren't on TV. One thing I'm very thankful for is the NCAA being able to generate enough revenue from other sports to allow smaller programs to exist. Soccer, women's basketball, baseball, baseball, tennis, track and field, swimming. On average, these sports don't make any money. They're able to exist because of the TV contracts for the SEC and Big Ten football, because of March Madness, because of merchandising, and because of the college football playoff. The NCAA is able to host events for all three divisions because the most profitable programs and sports subsidize those who don't bring in any money. The point of this video is to explain why the athletes don't get paid by the NCAA. The NCAA puts nearly all of the revenue back into the system for the athletes to benefit. When people discuss the NCAA paying athletes, the response is easy. There is no leftover money. Remember, we're talking about 480,000 student athletes. If they were all able to get paid $1,000 per year, the NCAA would need to generate another $480 million per year. What if I told you that student athletes already get paid? Athletes at the Power 5 schools receive a stipend that covers the full cost of attendance on top of the scholarship they already receive. They receive scholarships to cover tuition, food, room and board, books, and for athletes, they have many other services provided on top of that. Let's make the numbers simple. The market value of a full ride scholarship for an athlete is somewhere between fifty dollars to $75,000 per year if we break down everything that is provided. Each individual athlete is a small piece 
the machine that generates a little over $1 billion in revenue. If we view the NCAA like a company that generates a billion dollars in revenue and has employees, then each athlete is getting paid a pretty standard salary. Of course, there's going to be a few that are massively underpaid and a few who are getting overpaid, but on the wide scale aggregate, they're getting paid fairly. College athletes do get paid, and I'm not even including money handshakes with boosters and bag men. The real argument that is being made is whether the super small amount of athletes who actually generate revenue are getting paid enough. This is an unpopular opinion, but fans watch the front of the jerseys, not the back, which is why Alabama football and Kentucky basketball sell out stadiums every single year, even though the rosters turn over every year or two. Each individual athlete is a piece of a machine that was operating efficiently before and after them. Now, let's argue for the people who think they should get paid more, and most importantly, let's find the money. College athletics has become an arms race for the best athletic facilities, the biggest and baddest stadiums, the cool coolest campuses and who can land the next superstar coach. Coaching salaries have been inflating faster than the crypto market. What was once a million dollar job turned into Jimbo Fisher signing a $75 million contract to be the Aggies coach for the next decade. Nick Saban receives multiple cars and access to a private jet, while Lane Kiffin gets access to hot sorority girls. It's a great time to be a college football coach. Coaches have a short leash and get fired every couple of years if they don't win a championship. But have you seen a severance package as good as the one these guys receive? Tom Herman just got fired from Texas and received over $15 million to pack his bags. Willie Taggart led FSU's football program for 21 games and received $18 million for getting fired. 55 head football coaches make $3 million or more per year. These guys make so much money that if they put their yearly salary in GME stock, then the SEC would be knocking at their doors with notices for stock market manipulation. These large NCAA institutions wants you to believe that they aren't making any money. It's just like when I meet with my CPA and he asks why I have the exact same number for income and business expenses. I don't know, man, that's a weird coincidence. Clemson spent $55 million upgrading their facilities. Florida State claimed over $150 million in expenses, which was conveniently just under the $152 million the program generated in revenue. I had an unpaid internship with the FSU Athletic Department back in 2012, and I'm finding out now they were spending $150 million? College athletes aren't supposed to get paid on top of what they already earn, so the program spend the money elsewhere. Oh, our swimming team needs a new pool? I'll take some of that revenue and put it there. We need upgrades to our hall of fame box seats at the football stadium, we'll allocate some money there too. The NCAA plays a zero sum game because of its non-profit status and inability of sending money directly to the athletes. College athletic departments are in a similar boat. The money is out there. If you believe that athletes should be paid even more than what they already are, then the plan would be to simply allocate funds differently. If you like the current arms race of every school wanting to spend tens of millions of dollars on facilities, coach buyouts, and improved campuses, then there isn't any money available for paying the athletes. First, we're gonna remove the social construct of amateurism. We've all become comfortable changing the concept of amateur video star to only fans professional, so we can change the word amateur here as well. Amateur means you play for a college athletic department and not a professional sports organization. Who cares if you get paid? Second, you should be able to make money signing autographs and selling your personal gear. If AJ Green wants to sell his cleats and his jersey after a bowl game, then he should get a split of the profits. Same goes with the university selling jerseys jerseys that are clearly representing the star on the team. If a business wants to pay an athlete money to come speak at an event, they should get paid. And if an athlete wants to get paid promoting an affiliate link to a product, then they should be able to. Imagine a post-game interview where they ask the athlete how he was able to perform at the highest level and they respond, well, Aaron, I couldn't have played this well without today's sponsor, Bang Energy. You may only see this drink in the hands of unemployed influencers on Instagram, but it gives you the energy you need to succeed. Use the code SPENCER at checkout for 50% off your first First order. Okay, Aaron, about the game. Basically, the NCAA should remove the inability of athletes to make money using their name and likeness. They should get a cut of profits from the merchandise. And if a kid wants to make YouTube videos, he should be able to earn money from AdSense and maintain his scholarship status. Lastly, the NCAA should allow for a free market so we can determine what these athletes are really worth. If boosters and athletic departments want to pay a $40,000 signing bonus for an athlete to sign at their school, then they should be able to. They're already doing it under the table this would just allow them to do it on the table at the local McDonald's like the University of Tennessee does. 
You can't create a perfect system overnight. In order to create the ideal environment for athletes to be student athletes first and also get compensated for their true market value, then small changes will need to take place every year until we all figure it out. Until then, you're gonna hear every sports segment on TV include someone yelling that we need to pay the players without anyone looking at the actual financials and coming up with solutions. Small steps every year will lead to widespread changes. And then athletic departments will get to deal with the fallout of athletes getting paid and all of the problems with the system that we can't foresee right now. Thanks so much for watching.